Welcome to our free permaculture class. Sustainable Kashi is really proud to host these classes every week to help us connect with each other using permaculture as our foundation. So any suggestions for future classes or teachers, please just put them in the chat box and we'll do our best to get them here for you. Uh, we're located in Sebastian. We are on an 80 acre retreat uh, sanctuary located right by the St. Sebastian River. We have uh, nine demonstration gardens, uh, volunteer opportunities, classes, and workshops. So please check out sustainablekashi.com to learn more. Uh, today we're talking about bamboo, and this is a wonderful plant, very useful around the world, and I'm really happy to introduce Shanti, who has launched an organic bamboo farm in Central Florida back in 1998 and still lives there today. It's a very beautiful piece of property with the most bamboos um, I've seen in one place. So it's really nice to, uh, to have you here today, Shanti. Uh, she worked for Walt Disney Imagineering as a bamboo and ornamental grass specialist on the Animal Kingdom project. So if you've ever been out there, it's quite amazing work. Uh, she reintroduced bamboo as a tea and medicine to the Western culture almost 15 years ago and is passionate about creating extractions from every part of the bamboo plant. So without further ado, thank you so much for coming on Shanti and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you, Terry and Amy. Thank you guys, everybody for being here. Super excited to see everybody and talk about my favorite topic, <laughs> bamboo. So I have a little bit of it in the background, try and have it in there. Um, today, we're not going to talk so much about the tea and the medicinal parts. I would say go back to the other permaculture talk that I did in the spring, and that addresses a little bit more about that. And if you have any other information or questions, you can always contact me. So today we're talking specifically about growing because I get so many questions about how to grow and not just how to grow it, but also like long term, like what you were talking about, like these things that we talked about at the beginning are so important because um, there's so many nuances to this. It seems like a very simple thing and yet simple can get really complicated fast. So we're going to walk through just a whole bunch of little things. And if you have any questions afterwards, please go on the Facebook and we can have further discussions about details. So we'll start with the beginning part, which is what I like to, and I'm trying to get in the habit of correcting myself, is when we talk about bamboo, we always talk about it as a singular, and yet it's really, it should be talking about bamboos, because there are many, many, many different variations of bamboo. Um, and if we can go put up the slides, we can start with that too. And we'll just get a little bit of, just a little bit of uh, more visual on some of these things while I talk. Um, okay, so this one, so just, just to give you an idea, like, let's just talk about this particular one. And, and I am going to focus more on the subtropicals and tropicals. I have experience growing everything from um, up north in Maryland to subtropical, which is where I'm at in Central Florida, to tropical, which I've grown in Costa Rica. So I have kind of a variation of, of experiences on growing. This one right here, I love this as just like a conversational piece. This is Waman, but this, this particular Buddha that the Waman does is really interesting because a lot of bamboos, and I would, I would gander to say that probably every single bamboo will do this at some point. It's just a matter of finding it. It does this, you know, shortened node, which ends up creating that Buddha. But I mean, how interesting is that? Like, it, I mean, you have a, that doesn't look like what your quintessential bamboo looks like. So it's just fun to think like if bamboo can look like this, like what else other things are we making assumptions about that look like a particular way that really can look a whole bunch of variation ways. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so just to give you an idea, now here in this picture, we have two different runners. I just wanna give you just kind of a little bit of a view of like how different bamboo can look. This one on the, with the white, this is um, a vecchiae. And I mean, how amazing is this? This is just a little guy, right? There's a lot of little ones. There's some that only get like six inches tall, right? This is a little runner and, um, 
it, it's just amazing. It does this dye back around the leaf, which gives it that white look, which is just so fun. This is at my friend Edlandia's up in South Carolina. Um, more of a northern climate, but I mean, if you didn't know that bamboo could get only this big, you know, and then here on the left hand side is another runner just to give you two different variations of runners. This one is in um, at the Tabasco Corporation in Avery Island. This is um, I think it's bamboo zoides. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that one's bamboo zoides. Um, beautiful growing up around this like big, huge oak tree, but that's a big runner, right? So just to give you an idea. And then, and then of course we have the tropical clumpers and things. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so then we have the tropical clumpers. So just to give you an idea is that there are many different types of bamboo and they grow in many different environments. So we really need to talk about bamboo as bamboos because there's so many variations. And, and, and that really is becoming a key point, especially right now, because I get so many questions and so many people assuming that they can grow one type of bamboo in an area that it's not going to fit. There are bamboos for all many, 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 many areas in this world, except for the extreme cold ones um, that will do well. The, the real key to it is, is finding a bamboo that's correct for that location. And so that's really what I wanna talk a little bit more about in depth. Um, one of the number one uses, or the number one use for bamboo in the United States, still to this day, is ornamental. Um, almost entirely privacy. Almost entirely I'll go in or other bamboo people will go in on, you know, like this picture and they'll be like, I want my neighbor to disappear. I don't want to see the shed. I want to create more privacy for my pool. That's an, almost entirely what we're planting for. And the prices on bamboo have been elevated or they're higher because bamboo hasn't been as available. Um, we are getting into a point now where things are shifting. And this is another reason why I wanted to talk about this today because we are shifting into a place where bamboo is going to be used and is being used on a commercial farming scale, which it has been in the rest of the world or at least a lot of places in the world, South America, Central America, um, Asia, of course, and um, now we are, it is coming here, and where it's coming to is Florida, because we're the growing state, and we grow a lot of things, so we are shifting in the United States, so that's why another reason why I think it's really important to talk about growing bamboos, and how to grow them, how to maintain them, how to do this long term. These are things that have been done for many, many, many years in other parts of the world, either as natural resources that they already have or as plantations. Um, and a lot of what's been happening in most of the places that we think about bamboo is native populations. So when we think about South America, we think about Brazil, there's 100,000 acres of guadua growing there. That's all native. It's in the Ecuador, um, Brazilian, kind of that corner. And then we think about China, we have like, you know, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres growing there. And there's a lot of native spots around the world. We actually used to have big areas of native bamboo in the United States. We have a Rundin area, which is our native North American bamboo, most of which was destroyed um, way back almost like a hundred years ago. There were huge thousands of acres stands and um, that has all down to like, we call it river cane because a lot of times where the parts that are left are right along the river where nobody like cut it down, right? So that was, and that's a really interesting one because it was used a lot by the native, um, the native Americans and they used it for weaving, they used it for forage. And it was one that um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, which is interesting is about the flowering. Um, it seeds almost every year, that one. And so the seeds were used as a food. 
So that um, we're getting into that range now. We're in the baby phase of it. Uh, the other thing that bamboo is used for uh, the second most thing, the number one is privacy. The second is beautification. People like the look of it. They like the feel of it. They like the sound of it. They like the idea of it. And they just want to add it in to their space. You know, it's part of creating a space that nurtures you so that you can go out and do your best life um, because you're coming from a place that feeds you what you need. And so bamboo can be part of that if it's done in a correct manner. And like the woman was talking about earlier, you know, when that's done improperly or it becomes something that feels overwhelming, then that's not nurturing. And so it's really important to think about these things in advance as to where they're going. I always like when people can come and see what the bamboos are gonna look like down the road so they know what they're getting into because when you have a baby plant, it's never the same thing as something 10 years down the road. And although at the moment you're talking about, I want my neighbors to disappear now, whatever that rate of growth is that's happening at the beginning is going to continue. So if you have a fast growing bamboo, that fast growing bamboo is never gonna not be a fast growing bamboo until the day that it's no longer, that it, it's, it dies and goes on to another spot. But it's, so it's a matter of really finding something that fits into the area and the space that's gonna be proper for that space and for the person and how they're using the space. So I really like to think about those things. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so beautification, noise, air, these are runners. This is at my friend Daphne's farm, beautiful place up in Georgia. If you ever go, she does bamboo farming. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, windbreaks. This is really, really a big thing, not so much in the United States, although this one I planted out in um, St. Cloud, uh, but in areas like, I'm thinking like in Costa Rica along the uh, pineapple plantations, they use a lot of bamboo for windbreaks. Um, but even actually here in Florida, down in South Florida, in uh, sugarcane fields, they'll use it down there. So windbreaks is a big thing. And when you're talking about that, you want a big plant, you know, a big plant for a long, big area because you've got a big expanse going up to it. So you want that big wall of a block. Now, if we're talking about a windbreak, I used to have at my property when I first bought it, it had a a manufactured home, two by four construction, not strapped down anything. I mean, fairly light, right? As far as uh, uh, building structure. And I walled it in with fern leaf, which is one of the smallest ones that I grow. It only gets about 14 feet. And I had one of the hurricanes come just straight over my house. Welded construction blew off, my barn shifted. I had a lot of damage from it, but that trailer didn't budge at all because that fern leaf just held it right in place. And so oftentimes when I tell people, if you're looking for like protection of a building, big is not always better, small is better. Those ones, and when I say small, I'm talking 20 feet and under, 25 feet and under, the gracefuls, the fern leaves, the multiplexes and stuff like that. Things with a massive root system that aren't going anywhere, that aren't gonna damage your house. Bamboo in general doesn't damage your house. Um, but that really just hold that structure in place and act as that buffer barrier on the outside. It's super effective in storms, super effective. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, food and medicine, right? So bamboo shoots is something that's been used for a very, very long time. And it's an excellent source of nutrition. Um, so many different things on it. If you wanna learn more about that, you can go either to my website or my Instagram. I post a lot about the nutrition on my Instagram. Um, and then teas, teas, I've made uh, just really, really quickly, I've made um, tea and extracts from every single part of many different bamboos at this point. Uh, the one I stay away from is bamboo, so I vulgaris, but I've made it from Philistachys of the temperate ones to like the tropical ones, all different types. So 
many, many different edible medicinal uses of bamboo. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, forage, forage is a big one. So using bamboos as a forage material, I've done that for several different people now in, in Florida. And when I worked at Animal Kingdom, we had a large forage nursery that we planted bamboo for. Um, because almost every single animal there was fed bamboo and almost, I would say probably it's safe to say that every single zoo in the United States is using bamboo in some way in their forage program. Bamboo has about 13% protein, very high mineral content. So it's a low, um, <clears throat> it's a low protein, a low to mid protein content as far as like a forage in comparison to like peanut or alfa, alfalfa or something like that. But actually for like a horse, that's actually a, a much more beneficial uh, number to be at because they can kind of chew on it all day long, which is keeping them busy and keeping them fed, but they're not getting that huge um, amount of nitrogen that they, I mean, of protein that they don't really need all that at the same time. So it's an excellent forage and the animals love it. It's um, grasses are sweet. They have a sweet flavor to them. And so it's an excellent forage for that. Okay, what's the next one? And then, okay, so now we're getting into construction. So construction and poles. This is something probably people have seen a lot of information out there like Ibuku and the Bali stuff and just all the beautiful things that you can do with bamboo is so amazing. Uh, I think what some of the really creative, this is bamboo DNA that we did uh, out at Okeechobee. We did a music festival and my friends Gerard at Bamboo DNA, they built a tea house for me and I served tea at this music festival and we also did it at EDC in Orlando, the same structure. And it's just a really fun structure for people to come and see where they could experience drinking bamboo tea, being in a bamboo building around in a bamboo forest that we planted to really have an immersion experience of understanding that bamboo can be used in so many different ways. And, and that's just the tip of it, right? Those are just the real obvious ones. There's so many more ways that it can be used. Um, some of the really interesting things that people do with bamboo is utilizing it in ways that you can't use with wood, with you're accentuating those curves and the splits and things that bamboo is really, really good at. Okay, let's go to the next one. And this is my friend Chris in St. Augustine. He builds with bamboo and there's just an idea of some poles and things that he's got. He does some amazing things with it. Um, bamboo construction is not something that's been done a lot of in the United States. It's something I'd really like to encourage people to play with, either on a small or a large scale. I've had a few people recently come and get some poles for different things for flutes and things. And um, I just want to encourage people to use it because the real, the, the, the real crux of this is, is that a plant, there's only too much of a plant if we haven't found the uses of what we can do with it. And bamboo has so many uses. The only reasons that people are finding it necessary to use words like invasive and monster and overpowering and overwhelming and just all these those negative connotations that go with bamboo is because we aren't doing a good enough job at focusing on what it can be used for and all the benefits that it can be used for even on a small scale. Okay, let's go to the next one. On that, on the other side was just, um, just an idea that, you know, you can use the extracts of bamboo for so many things and shampoo. Okay, this is one of my favorite ones. So I'm going to be doing a little workshop on Saturday at my place on biochar. Biochar, most people know what biochar is. It's almost like, in some ways, I wonder if bamboo isn't just solely designed. I mean, I say this about a lot of things. It's solely designed to make medicine or it's solely designed to like clean the air, clean the water. But biochar is like, biochar is one of the major solutions of what we're going to do to put the carbon from the air back into the soil. And when you're talking about that, you're really talking about plants that grow very, very, very quickly because they are very good at sequestering that carbon out of the air and 
putting it into the structure of the plant. And then you take that structure of the plant, you make it into biochar, and it goes back into the soil. And we'll talk more about this on Saturday at my workshop. But this is, this is something that if bamboo was just being grown for that, it would be enough. The fact that it can be used for so many other things at the same time is just like above and beyond, which is what nature always does for us, is provides us like not only can it do this, it can also do all these other things. And that's why I get so excited about talking about this plant, because if we only grew bamboo to create biochar and pull carbon out of the air and put it back into the soil, it would be enough. That would be enough right there. That would be amazing. So just so many different things. And this is a really exciting, if you don't know about biochar, really get into like, there's some good podcasts and stuff out there that really talk about, explain why it's so important and what it's so good for. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the last couple of things that I wanted to talk about just as far as uses is erosion control. Um, this is, I see this a lot in places like Costa Rica, um, Puerto Rico, um, where you're seeing a lot of these elevations, you know, here in Florida, we don't have elevations really as much, so we don't have as much, but even so, I still see it like along riverbanks and things like that, but in places where you have these mountain areas, and especially like with this type of soil, like where they have the clay that just kind of just slides off the face of the earth, um, really, the, the like, something like a fern leaf, these smaller multiplexes that just have massive root systems, they are phenomenal at holding soil together. And also when we're talking about, so I'm talking a lot about the tropicals and subtropicals because that's where I live, but this is also true for northern areas when we're talking about the, um, the temperate bamboos and using them for soil erosion holding soil in place is really important. And it's something, um, finding plants, grasses specifically are very good at this, and, and really finding these massive root system plants that do a really good job of that is, is really good. Um, bioremediation. When we talked about biochar before, the other thing is bioremediation. Uh, last year in Oregon, I got to hear this talk of uh, these guys who were working on the wastewater management system, and they were using bamboo because they have a big problem with copper in their water, and so they were using it to specifically pull the copper out. Bamboo can is really good at, at sequestering, um, especially metals. Uh, this can be good and bad. It can be bad if you're talking about eating it and you're pulling heavy metals out. It can be good if you're talking about pulling heavy metals out as far as bioremediation. Bioremediation is an amazing field, and um, the, the areas that bamboo is being used in is just starting, we're just on the cusp of learning about that and what it can do. Um, but it was having really big successes with pulling copper out. So that was amazing. Okay, so now we're gonna go into talking about um, the different types of bamboo. Uh, and, and really, most people think of bamboo as in two categories. We have runners and we have clumpers. And it's really a lot more of just a continuum. Just like everything else, it's not black and white. There is a continuum of them. In general, here in the subtropics to tropics, we have what we call clumping bamboo or sympodial bamboo. And those, in general, can be fairly tight clumping. Now, within that range, there's also like much looser tropicals, like Guadua is a really good example. Um, and that one is considered a sympodial scattered. Uh, the ones that are tighter are considered sympodial tufted. And there's a whole variation of those in between. And what I'm talking about is how tight the actual clump of bamboo is. So when it's really, really tight together, that's because the, the way the rhizome grows is it grows in this little U shape that just comes up in a really tight form. That form 
can be elongated and it can be really tight. And that's the difference that you see when you look at different bamboos with their, what I call like an open structure versus a tight structure. And it's just a matter of how they grow. So some are more open structures. Some like the guadua as a tropical plant is actually more of like, almost like what most people would consider a runner or a monopodial, which is where you have a horizontal. It's not, but it's it's a such an open structure that it it's kind of hard to discern. So um, the running bamboos or the monopodial bamboos are ones that have a horizontal shoot that goes up and then they send. So they start here and they end up over there. And that's, those are the ones that people get really afraid of, of them moving from one place to another. And for good reason, right? So, and then we have the clumping, which are the others. And then there's actually one that's like a combination of them. So, and in the North, not only do you have running bamboos, but you also have clumping cold hardy bamboos. So these variations exist all throughout the whole thing. And that's another reason why when you're picking the bamboo that you want, whether it's one bamboo for your backyard or 50 bamboo for your backyard or 100,000 bamboo for your farm, like the type of bamboo that you're picking, I cannot emphasize this enough, the type of bamboo that you're picking is really important to get information on from a person who actually grows bamboo because there are so many variations. There are also so many, you know, conditions to think about. We need to think about, is it hardy? This is a big one. Is it going to freeze the next time we have a freeze? Now, I may not have had a hard freeze in three years, but you can be sure that it's coming. Um, is it going to work in my soil? Um, the freeze thing is really important in Florida because in Florida, our frost zone actually goes all the way down to the Everglades. And so what we're seeing now where people are planting a lot more tropicals north, if you're planting a tropical and it's in your backyard and you lose it and it's one, that's a big mess for you, but it's not an overwhelming thing. If you're planting a hundred acres of a tropical and you're in Ocala, you've got a big problem, right? So, and these are the things that are coming up now. And so this is why it's so important to really get accurate information about what type of bamboo you're growing and the conditions that it will grow in and the conditions that you have available and be very realistic about what you're doing. Okay. So that covers like, oh, I have a, a little party trick. Am I, can actually anybody see me? I don't know if you can see me or not. Anyway, so yes, this is, uh, what? We can see you. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, this is a Philistachys. This is just a party trick that you can show people just to tell people that you know what bamboo is and you know how to tell the difference between a a running bamboo and a clumping bamboo. Now, this is not all running bamboos or all mono, you know, the running bamboo people do not like to refer to them as running bamboos because they like to call them temperates or monopodials. Um, this is Philistachys and it's got a little bit of a groove here. So Philistachys always have this groove. Not all running bamboos or monopodial bamboos or philostachys, but it's a huge amount of them. It's so many that if you run your finger along and you feel this little groove here, that is a Philistachys. And so that's just kind of a fun little party trick. Um, interestingly enough, this little groove here also exists in the Guadua bamboo. And that is the, um, uh, it's, it's considered a clumping bamboo, but it's so close to a runner that it really is going, it, it's almost, it's almost, it acts like one. And that's a tropical bamboo. And it also has this little groove, which is kind of fun because it makes you wonder if they're, you know, somewhere way back related. Okay, I lost my screen as far as my, uh, my slides. All right, cool. Um, so that's just something fun that you can, you can do. 
Um, I have an here. Okay, so here we have this is the example. So on the one side we have a running bamboo. On the other side we have a clumping bamboo. I think most people know what I'm talking about when I talk about both of these things, but you can kind of get a real good idea. The Denver bamboos or monopodial bamboos or you know these running bamboos are ones that you can walk through. Typically with the uh, clumping bamboos, these are clumpers that you know, the circle just gets bigger and bigger. Okay, next slide. All right, these are my friends out in uh, Oregon, bamboogarden.com. If you are a Northern grower and or want to grow in the North and you want to put in uh, a temperate bamboo, you want to put in a barrier. And there, and it's very, it, it, you put it in, it's done, you address it, and then that's how you deal with it. And it's really should be done at the time that you install the bamboo and then it's good to go. These guys have a lot of information on that kind of thing. If you're in a Northern area or like in Europe or things where you're growing and you want to grow bamboo, look at their website. They have a lot of information, really good information on how to do this. Um, it's not something we typically do here in Florida because we are growing the clumping bamboos. Um, so I just put that out there as far as like information for you to have for growing those. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to get into maintenance and I'm going to focus a little bit more on our area, my area, um, but just know that, you know, some of these things overlap and I'll try and address it because like, again, what I really want to emphasize is there are many types of bamboo and each one grow differently. And so really the key to all of this is, is talking to somebody who actually grows bamboo and has been growing it for a while and they can show you they're older plants and they can show you what that bamboo is going to do and they can also tell you what to do down the road because it's one thing to have a little baby plant that is new and small and in a three gallon pot and it's a whole nother thing to have something 15 years down the road from there that is like 40 feet tall. So we're going to talk a little bit about maintaining. One of the fun things that we do here in Florida that I think we kind of pioneered, I would, I'm going to put that out there as we did <laughs> as Floridians, um, is doing these hedges, which is really fun. So hedging is big here. Obviously, we do a lot of hedges, a lot of viburnums, things like this. And bamboo can also be hedged. All bamboo can be hedged. So when you hedge a bamboo, um, and this works really amazingly well for clumping bamboos. Um, I'm going to say let's not do this for running bamboos, but I have not played around. Actually, you probably could. Actually, you probably could. If I haven't, I, I haven't planted as many of those. So um, if you planted them close together, you could hedge them. And actually, this would probably do the same thing. Not quite as much, but definitely along the same lines. Um, this is, this is uh, graceful. So Graceful, the planting that you would do for this is when you hedge the top or top them, what happens is they end up leafing all the way down and it just gives you that really nice, beautiful hedged look. Um, if you don't hedge them, what happens is all, almost all bamboos, not all, but for the most part, their leaves gravitate on the clumping bamboos, gravitate towards the top third and actually for the runners too. Um, top third of the plant and that gives you that quintessential bamboo look of the, the leaves at the top and the columns at the bottom. Um, but this is an interesting way to do it and the way that you create these living fences is the spacing. So as long as you keep the spacing within range it won't go clump, clump, clump with a whole bunch of space in between. And, and really the key is getting them tight enough together so that at the beginning when they're growing, they recognize themselves as being the same. And then if you plant them too far apart, what happens is they always kind of want to be apart. Now I did have this really interesting thing happen uh, about three years ago. I had two really big clumps originally planted about 23 years ago. And, and they were about 25 feet apart. 
So one was here and one was there, and they were very distinctly separate. And what happened is over time, they got wider and wider. These are big, big ones. So they're about 10 feet across at the base. And at about three years ago, so we're like 20 years into this at this point, they both sent up a shoot right in the middle. Like they finally recognized that they were, and they were actually the same plant. So they finally recognized that they were the same plant and they sent up two shoots right in the middle and they formed a third plant. So to me, that kind of stuff is like fascinating. It's like, whoa, what is going on here? You know, this is pretty interesting because all that's happening underground. You can't see what's going on. Um, but when you're doing these living fences, the real key is keep them tight together, do the spacing tight at the beginning on something like graceful, you're talking like three, four feet apart and, um, and putting it in that row to create that effect, just like you would with a podocarpus or a bifernum. It's the same sort of idea. And then you're topping them and keeping them hedged. And you can do this even for big guys like sea breeze. So that's, that's a really interesting um, and fun way to maintain them. When you're first getting started, you're going to want these, the tropical and subtropical bamboos love water. Um, a lot of them can stand sitting in water for extended periods of time. My friend Nick out in St. Cloud, he likes to say they can swim, right? You know, here in Florida, we need to know, can the plant swim or can it swim? Because sometimes we have these spaces that go underwater for maybe a week at a time or something in the summer, but then the rest of the time they're dry. So knowing if the plant can survive during that is a big deal of knowing like what the expectation is. Bamboos, tropical and subtropical bamboos tend to love water. Um, that's not true for all of them, but that's true for many that we grow here in, you know, in, in Florida. And so a lot of water to be get, to get going. What I usually tell people here in Florida is you get them past the first rainy season. So if I'm planting now, I want to keep watering all the way up through the, you know, the next rainy season. And then if the soil conditions are fairly good, if we're not talking yellow sugar sand, they are usually fairly good to go. The other thing is, is that bamboo grow kind of like a goldfish in a bowl, right? So they're going to grow as fast as the nutrients that they're given. They're given more food, they're given more water, they're gonna grow faster. And that's just a part of it. So if you want to get them growing faster and you want to keep them growing faster, you keep watering and feeding them and, and they will keep going. Um, interesting thing about biochar and carbon is that if you add um, <clears throat> carbon back into the soil, if the plant has access to carbon, you can decrease the use of water and fertilizers significantly. And this is a big deal when growing bamboo because they need a lot of these nutrients. Um, so, you know, your organic soils that you have, people who live in, like I live in the swamp, so I have all these like really black soils, the bamboo love it, and then I don't need to water them because they already have access to all of that, those nutrients that make them less needy for these other things. Okay, so short term, at the beginning, we're gonna talk about watering them. If you're in a dry location, really well drained, you may need to continue watering them forever. That just might be part of it. They're pretty good at get going. Some are a little bit better than others, but they're, they require water. They are a big water and food plant, just like a banana. Okay, next slide. Um, <clears throat> so, what I like to do is try and figure out what else you can grow in bamboo. And this has been something I've been working on, I don't know, probably from the beginning because <clears throat> what happens is as bamboos get going, in the beginning, on the one side where the pumpkins are, you can see there's a lot of available space for stuff to grow because the bamboos aren't that big. But as they get bigger, their root system is taking up all the space and then it becomes harder for things to grow. That's not impossible for things to grow, but it's harder for things to grow. So I like to try and play with like, what else can you get in there? And pumpkins and things that grow along the surface do really, really well. And I've been having a lot of fun pl planting pumpkins because they just like start in one place and end up somewhere else. <laughs> 
they're just super fun. So um, super, a lot of success with pumpkins, a lot of success with beans. These guys, I harvest probably like one big basket a day and they're just growing up on the bamboos. Um, and yams I'm growing, but I'm growing them in pots and then letting them climb the bamboos. All these things don't hurt the bamboos at all. <clears throat> and so what I'm, I'm trying to work on is plants that I can grow companion plants with bamboos that allow me to produce other things in the same space. And of course I have my natives and bidens and all those things that grow up in between. Um, things that go down tend to do better with bamboo. So like if you have a trees and things like that, um, interestingly enough, wax myrtles, which are a nitrogen fixer, tend to grow right at the base of, of my bamboos here. And right now I'm talking about Florida again. Um, and so bamboo is a heavy nitrogen feeder and the wax myrtles will grow right at the base of them. And so there's, there's definitely, you know, some give and take going on there. These fungal and microbial connections that bamboo is so good at creating in the soil food network that's going on in there. I mean, they have the ability to uptake every single nutrient that's in the soil. And it's because of these bacterial and fungal partnerships that they make. They're also giving it back to the plants around them and they're giving it back in several different ways. Um, one way is just through their leaf litter. That leaf litter comes down, it creates the perfect environment for um, funguses and mycelium to grow right at the surface there, which is where it wants to grow. And those are then connecting back to bring more nutrients to the bamboo, but they're also sharing those nutrients with other plants in the vicinity. And so it's giving back through its underground network, it's giving back through its leaf litter, which is literally raining down silica onto the ground itself, which is a nutrient binder feeding back to the plants and, and giving back to the forest community. And in this way, bamboo it is participating because it's such a powerful um, photosynthesizer. It has the ability to take in so many sugars and trade those sugars through its fungal and bacterial partnerships and give it back to the other plants in the area and the soil itself. I mean, another way to look at bamboo is perhaps it's there to actually remediate the soil. Um, and we can talk, let's talk just for a minute about flowering, because <laughs> this is a really important topic. Okay, so when we talk about flowering, when we talk about bamboos and their ability, you know, when we talk about, look at the native bamboos of South America, what's fascinating to me is that <clears throat> where those bamboos are growing is super fertile and it's still unknown as to whether the fertility happened before and that's where the bamboos went or the fertility happened because the bamboos were able to come in and change the pH and change the soil dynamic and things like that. And the other thing is, is that a bamboo is not necessarily a forever thing. It has a time frame and a lifespan that it goes to. And that's when we're gonna talk about the flowering. So. Every bamboo has a different flowering schedule. Um, there are some that flower every single year. There are some that flower every five years. Oftentimes when you see bamboo seeds for sale on eBay or things like that, you're getting one of those ones that'll flower every year, or every five years. There's some bamboos that flower, but they don't die. There's some bamboos that flower and they do die. And that's called gregarious flowering. Um, in my 30 years of working with bamboo, I've experienced two different types of flowering, actually more one than the other, which is intermittent flowering, which doesn't get talked about a lot. And so intermittent flowering is where part of the bamboo will flower and that part will continue to flower sometimes even 15 years, 10 years, 12 years. And as it flowers, those parts die. And that can happen because of stress, maybe the bamboo is sitting in water for too long, maybe it's too dried out for too long, maybe just for one reason or another, sometimes they just do it. And part of the bamboo will flower and, and then it'll come back out of it. And then the plant won't com completely die and it will go on and keep living. I've experienced that on probably just 
six different variations just on my farm. Um, the other thing that it's really well known for is the gregarious flowering. And this is um, when we're talking about choosing bamboos, especially on plantations and large scale, is really, really important to address because gregarious flowering can be devastating. Um, it can also be amazing. It just depends on which way you look at it. So gregarious flowering is where the plant itself goes into flower and it puts all of its energy into flowering. And over those next three years, usually something like that, it puts so much energy into it that it kills it. So you lose that whole plant. And when we're talking about production plantations that are growing for a long term, you're losing like a thousand acres of that plant. That's a big deal. Now, granted, you're getting a lot of seed and new plants, but you have to start over again and then you have to wait for them to grow and all that kind of stuff. So gregarious flowering is a big deal. And in Asia where um, what happens is that particular clone of that particular plant will flower wherever it is. So if I take a piece of my old hammock and I send it to Puerto Rico and I send it to Africa and I send it to Asia and I send it to California, that clone of that plant will flower at the same time wherever it is. It doesn't matter. That's not to say that that plant itself will flower everywhere because they're not all the same clone. They're genetically a little bit different. Each seed that those plants came from originally is genetically different. And so each one of them has a little bit of a different time frame. There are several unknowns here that are really key to think about, especially when we're talking about planting on large scale, is that when we're talking about gregarious flowering, we A, don't know what the beginning is unless we grow it from seed. And we B, know very little about exactly what that time frame is. Some of them are, like I said, one year, five years, 80 years, 50 years, 120 years, 150 years. There is a huge variation. And especially with the older ones where we're talking multi-generations in order to track even how long that plant takes to flower, it's very a lot of lot of unknowns. And so my real concern when we start talking about planting plantations in the United States is that that's a lot of that's a lot of uncertainty. And uncertainty is not a good thing when you're talking about planting for a long term. You really want to know what you're getting into. And there's a solution for that. The solution is diversity. So Diversity is stability in any situation that you put it in. I don't care if you're talking about your own personal body or you're talking about planting 100,000 acres in Brazil. Diversity is stability. And diversity is stabilizing in multiple ways, of course, like nature does. Um, it is stabilizing by giving you multiple options. So like if one of your plants goes into flower, maybe you have 10 other varieties that you've planted that are not going into flower and you at least have something to keep you going while you plant the other one. And now you've got another one that you've got at zero, which is a great thing because now you know where you're going, right? You know where you're starting from. You at least have, have eliminated one of the unknowns. So this flowering thing is really important to understand, especially when we're talking about large scale. Um, because the monoculturing of bamboo is, I think, a little bit dangerous as far as like just the investment portion of it and not knowing um, where or when or how long this plant is going to be around for and that you're going to be able to harvest it for. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so beautiful, right? Look at these colors. You know, I, I just I just keep going back to the diversity of bamboo and just, you know, the, the idea of like, of just knowing how many variations of bamboo there are out there and how like spectacular each and every one is, you know. I mean, I'm a little obsessive, so um, <laughs> I get super excited about all of them. I love them all. And I love going and visiting, you know, like my fun thing to do when I'm not on my farm is going to go visit other farms. That's just me. All right, next slide. Okay, here we have a flower. So this is what bamboo looks like when it flowers. Isn't that beautiful? It's a seed, right? So it's a, it's a grass seed. 
And um, those seeds can be used for a lot of different things. I mean, mainly the big thing that it's good for is knowing that that, that plant that you grow from that seed is now at zero. You've now started at the very beginning of that phase again, and you've probably got at least your lifetime and maybe half of your kid's lifetime before you get to the next one um, on a lot of these. Let's not talk about all of them in general, but on a lot of them. So beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, when pollinated, and the seeds are also edible. One of the things that we hear a lot about, if you've ever learned about gregarious flowering, is in Asia where the, you know, they, gregarious flower, gregarious flower, there's seeds everywhere, the rat population goes up, the disease population goes up, like there's just this huge kind of cycle and then it, you know, everything dies out. And I guess the um, strategy of the bamboo and the gregarious flowering is that it's inundating everything with so much as so many times that not everything can take advantage of it. Now in South America, there's um, Guadua, uh, Guado is an interesting one because it doesn't, it, it'll do this intermittent flowering um, more often than not. And um, there are certain bird species that rely on it for that, which is, is really fascinating. The, uh, you know, kind of the whole habitat that forms around bamboo and bamboo groves that um, animals have come to rely on for these things in order to survive. There's a frog species in, uh, in South America that just lives in this little hole that's made originally in the shoot by another, I think like a, a wasp or a, a cicada, it's like one of those two. And then, and then that grows up and then it forms this little hole that's in this perfect spot because the inside of the bamboo is hollow, right? And so this, this frog just lives right in that little hollow spot where there's a little bit of water in there and it's like, you know, I mean, those kind of things where these animals have developed a way that their survival is based upon these plants. It's fascinating. There's something called a bamboo rat, which is actually super cute. And he lives in the bamboo and he's, he's developed these, um, these claws and hands that allow him, paws that allow him to climb the bamboo where other things can't. So it allows him to be in a safer range. Um, than other animals where he can get out of the way. And he also lives inside the calms. Um, so I just, you know, there's a lot more than just pandas that are reliant on the bamboo. Um, one of the things that I notice in my farm is that I have so many birds. Birds just love the bamboo. They love to sit in it and they feel so comfortable and build their nests in it and things like that. It really is such a great um use for it to create habitat for those animals um, in in our space and um and and other insects so insects we need insects insects 90 percent of the carbon that is in our soil in our forests comes from insects and so Insects are really important. And I'll just give you one example real quick is the bumblebee. So the first 10 years that I lived on my farm, I didn't have any bumblebees. And I, I grew up with, you know, you hold bumblebees and you know, they crawl around on you and they're so cute. I love bumblebees. And uh, in the last 13 years, I have had an explosion in population of bumblebees and just bees in general, because bees really like bamboo. Um, they actually collect some of the, um, parts of the bamboo that come out of the inner node, like a, almost like a sap that comes out and um, probably use it to build their nests with. But I also think that with bumblebees, because they're, um, they're, they like to have little holes that they go into, is that probably a lot of the bamboo that I get cut that I put back into the forest and let sit there is like creating that perfect little hole for them to get into and make a little nest. Okay, next, next slide. These are just some more pictures of bamboos. You get these beautiful stripes and colors and you can see a little bit what I'm talking about with these more open spacing versus tight spacing. It's just whole variations in between. All right, next slide. And that's a more tight clumping one, just to give you an idea. This is something that is just, I mean, you couldn't drive a semi through any of these really, but especially this one, you know, just 
bounce right off of it, right? So when we're talking about building privacy, we're not just talking about privacy as far as being able to see. We're talking about noise, air, water, um, and physical barriers. Like I plant a lot of times on people who live on very, very busy roads and you don't want somebody ending up in your yard at two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. And that happens a lot. So just putting something like this along the front of it is a really good way. And, uh, and hitting this with a car versus hitting a tree is a lot more comfortable. All right, next one. I think we're at the end now. Yeah. Okay. So this just gives you um, my contact information. And I hope that we just, we, you know, it's kind of fast and furious going through a lot of different things. But I think the idea that I really wanted to impart to everybody is that there are so many variations. And when you're talking about whether you're talking about planting on a small scale or a large scale, please just do some research by talking to somebody who grows bamboo. Most of the people who I know who grow bamboo are amazing people. We have amazing people here in Florida, but there's amazing people all over the world who grow bamboo and have been loving on this plant and know this plant really well. And it's important that you get information from them because they've been doing it, you know? And then you get the right plant for the right space in the right way, and it makes everything down the road a whole lot easier. Um, knowing what you're starting with, getting the right plant for the situation, making sure that it's hardy, making sure that, you know, if you're in a frost area, you're not growing a tropical, that if you're in a, you know, if you're growing a, you know, a running bamboo that you're putting in a um, barrier, all these things that, you know, seem really simple, but 10 years down the road, they can get really uncomfortable if you pick the wrong one. And there's so many out there. So um, if you have any questions for me, uh, you can contact me and I'm available and I love talking about bamboo, as you can tell. So <laughs> my favorite topic. Thank Shanti. you, Jerry. Oh my gosh. It's Amy. so wonderful. Uh, I mean, I could sit and listen to you talk bamboo forever and you take it to the next level because you have a true love for this plant and you do everything so completely and genuinely. I love coming to your house and uh, having tea because you become one with the plants as you're preparing them and your apothecary is just so impressive. So thank you for being a true steward for these plants and for being yourself. Oh, thank you. So thank it's you. really wonderful having you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna, we have a lot of questions on the chat. So we're gonna put those on the Facebook group um, Amy's going to put that up. It'll be a lot easier for us to answer all those for you. And if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in that Facebook group and we can get all your bamboo questions answered. Uh, Shanti would love to come there and make sure everybody gets the answers. Uh, as you can tell, she can talk about bamboo for a very, very long time. <laughs> we hope you really <laughs> we hope you uh, got something out of the class. If you did, please uh, feel free to donate to our uh, PayPal. We have ways to keep uh, the Zoom line up and going. Uh, we'll put a link right there in the chat. And uh, please check out the uh, discussion in the Facebook group. I want to give a big thanks to Amy Zelt for uh, running the call. She does so much behind the scenes that makes all this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll be make sure that we upload this video on YouTube so you can all watch it and get more information there. Uh, next week, we have Michael Richardson from Australia. He's going to be talking about connecting the oceans. So he's really going to connect us to the, uh, the world beneath the sea. So we're really excited about having him come in. Uh, from Australia, which will be a one o'clock in the morning for him. So it'd be really nice for him to share with us. <laughs> um, bamboo gets its strength by being flexible. Uh, we're here in a time in history where we can't keep repeating destructive ideas that led us to this dis disconnected way of life. Uh, here we can learn lessons from nature by watching the flexibility of bamboo. We can see that it's always moving with the wind. It's always changing. So we can bend to a regenerative way of life and create more healthy and happy humans in our world. Thank you for joining us in this important topic and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye everyone. Yeah.